Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. If you're a returning favorite, then congrats. You're a member of our Fresh Ketchup crew. If you're new to the show, welcome home. My name is Mark Ellis, and I am the host today. I'll be steering the ship or playing the game, as it were, for this particular episode. My wonderful co-host, Jacqueline Coley, is off today because she's on vacation. She's probably having her toes touch the sand of some exotic Hawaiian locale. Meanwhile, I'm here in Los Angeles. And, you know, people tell me, Mark, you work hard. You should take a vacation sometimes. But then I start to think about it and I get to talk movies and tell jokes for a living. It, because of everybody who's listening or watching this show right now, my entire life is a vacation. So thank you. And we're going to talk about a movie that has, I guess, some sort of vacation destinations, but it would be a bold move. It'd be a bold move if you went to any of these places that are depicted in the film because we're talking about... Jumanji, the 1995 Jumanji, the OG, the one that kicked it off starring Robin Williams, Bonnie Hunt, a couple of cute tykes, including Gears to Dunst. So that movie, shockingly, I know I'm going to break a lot of inner children hearts right now. It's 52 percent rotten on the tomato meter, if you can believe it. It is barely fresh on the audience score with 62 percent, but it's still I don't know. Sounds a little low to me. So we're going to be talking about that with three very special guests who happen to be dear friends of mine who have launched a new podcast endeavor underneath their banner of the world girls that's right roxy steph and doreen are going to be joining me momentarily but first big fan shout out time everybody seems to uh, be begging for us to talk about jumanji and that's been going on for quite some time here you go. So you're welcome. Sean McGrawhan, Jacob Schrader, Nicholas Bayfield, he's a returning champ, Sol Laredo, and English teacher Alex Hellier and his year eight students. So everyone in Alex's class right now, I want you to pay attention, spit the gum out, bang erasers after class, and right now pay attention to whatever Professor Hellier is telling you because he has good taste in film, or at least for this one. And I don't really have good taste in anything except when it comes to to choosing guests for this show because producing Lucy and I were talking it over and we said, who can we have to step in for Jacqueline and who can we have as a special guest talking about Jumanji? And then like a bolt of lightning, it hit us. The stars of the new podcast, Bitch Out of Water. I didn't come up with the title. I'm just the messenger here. Underneath the World Girls banner, it is Steph Sabra, Dorena Ariano, and Roxy Stryer, my three pals. Welcome to the show, everyone. Good to have you all back. I want to get into the podcast y'all just started. We're going to do that after we talk to Jumanji. But first, before I say hello to Roxy and Dorena, Steph Sabra, you are back from a whirlwind vacation that literally took you to all parts of the globe. Yeah, I can't believe I'm back. It doesn't feel like it. But I was texted Mark when I was away. I was like, guess what, Mark? I am now drinking beer. So now our friendship can really excel to the next level as we have a beer together, hopefully uh, after this Jumanji episode. That's right. We are shifting into third gear and we'll have the Uber driver do that because we're going to be drinking some brewskis because Steph is on board. Uh, Darina, you and I have shared many a uh, an adult beverage. You prefer the uh, the mezcal tequila. I do, Mark, but I do enjoy the IPA, as you know, because we both like very bitter things like our uh, adult, uh, very bitter uh, souls. But I think we're bitter inside, but towards the world, we're happy, right? <laughs> I, every time I see you, I know you want to have this dark soul and I believe that it's there and I do not want to be cursed in any way, but you are a bright light in a cruel world, as is Roxy Stryer. Roxy, one of the greatest backgrounds and a deserving one for you because you are our Hollywood star. Yeah, but it just says it says Hollywood. I messed up. I'm I'm here in Hollywood, and that feels like my life. Here I am, the queen of Hollywood. Yeah, it's Hollywood yep. adjacent. So I'm <laughs> I'm thrilled to talk to y'all about Jumanji because it seems like this was a movie that a lot of people's childhood centered around. I mean, we loved Robin Williams as an actor, as a comedian. He was great in Aladdin, but then Jumanji comes along, and it just sort of felt like, oh man, this is like a great kids '90s movies. Fifty. 2% rotten on the tomato meter. I'm going to kick it back to you first, Rox. Is that score low? Is that too high? Is Rotten Tomatoes wrong about Jumanji? It just makes you question what happened. Like, how did we possibly, as a society, get it that wrong this time? Mm -hmm. Rotten Tomatoes is super wrong on this one because I don't know anybody who thinks that this movie isn't great. 
And I'm sure somebody listening right now is like, well, me, I'm the one person. Fine, go have fun with yourself because the rest of us love this movie. Rotten Tomatoes is really wrong about this. This should be in the, I, I want to say in the 90s. I mean, this is a really, really solid childhood movie that definitely, y'all got this wrong. Roxy's giving it all the way to the 90s. How about you, Dorena? How do you see Jumanji and the tomato meter? Well, I think it's actually better than most adventure family movies nowadays. Um, I think f- for the 90s specifically, I remember being a 13-year-old child in the theater, enjoying the crap out of this, uh, being scared and thrilled, not as scared as Steph Sabra, obviously, because she thinks this is a horror movie. It but is. It, It's not, Steph, but I'm <laughs> glad is. you think so. Uh, but <laughs> it's so much fun. It's so exciting. The cast is fantastic. Every single ingredient to this movie should have it at least in the 80%. Like, I don't know what happened. 50% way too low. Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. 52% of the tomato meter. It's rotten according to that. What does Steph Sabra say about Rotten Tomatoes? Are they wrong about, I guess, one of your childhood horror movies? Yeah, I love Rotten Tomatoes, but this score disgusts me. Uh, not to pull the legend or the dead legend card, but out of respect for Robin Williams and the joy he spread specifically in this movie, but everything he does or did, why would this be this low? Like, this is... This makes me sad because there's going to be kids who look up this movie saying like old classics I should watch. And then they're going to go on Rotten Tomatoes and then they're going to be like, should I watch it? And it's like, of course you should watch it. Because like Dorino saying, this is one of the greatest horror children films (laughs) of all time. And it's like a ride from start to finish. A great ride. Scary ride. It's so funny because recently we were talking about the 1982 movie Annie with our good friend Alicia Malone. And it's sort of like similar where you have like a lot of darkness in a children's movie. You get some of that in Jumanji. And the the, the two recent Jumanji films with Kevin Hart and and The Rock and, and, and all of them, those are like fresh on the tomato meter and on the audience score. So, you know, our hope here, I guess, because I think Rotten Tomatoes is wrong, too. I think this should at least be a fresh movie. If you want to keep it in the 60s, fine. But I think it deserves to be fresh. If for nothing else because of what Steph said out of respect for the late great Robin Williams if we have time I'll tell you my Robin Williams story if not we'll kick it to another day because we have a lot more Robin Williams movies to discuss on Rotten Tomatoes is wrong but right now we turn it over to our good friend Tim Ryan he's our expert review curation manager here at Rotten Tomatoes and he's going to tell us what the critics were saying wrongly so according to the world girls at the time of Jumanji's release Tim take us back to 1995 two with Tim. Occasionally, people will tell me that they're bummed out that one of their favorite movies from their childhood is a low score on Rotten Tomatoes. And my take on that is critics usually watch a movie once before reviewing it, and they generally have no idea whether it'll be embraced or forgotten in the future. My other take is you should never have any shame if you love a movie or if you have a happy memory of watching a movie as a kid. Those formative experiences help you to fall in love with movies in the first place. For a decent number of people of a certain age, Jumanji was a formative cinematic experience. As Andre Meadows of Black Nerd Comedy said in a retrospective review, it was totally one of those 90s movies specifically made for 90s kids. But at the time of its release, by and large, the critical opinion on Jumanji was that it took the bare bones of Chris Van Allsburg's wonderful book and turned it into a special effects extravaganza, and that while those effects were admittedly pretty impressive, too often they pushed the human characters off to the side. Jumanji is rotten at 52% with 46 reviews, and it has a 62% audience score. So what did the critics have to say? In a rotten review, Rita Kempley of the Washington Post wrote, The technology both overwhelms the human cast and stalls the narrative drive. Even William's manic energy finally flags. However, in a fresh review, Ron Yamauchi of Vancouver's Georgia Strait wrote, As he did with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, director Joe Johnston successfully juggles frenetic special effects action with gentle character moments. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, A feast for the eyes with a somewhat malnourished plot, Jumanji is an underachieving adventure that still offers a decent amount of fun for the whole family. So that's Jumanji. Let's kick it back to Mark. The only way you'll be able to escape the wild chaos of this podcast is if you yell Jumanji at the end. Back to you folks. 
<laughs> I don't even know if that one's going to get me out alive here, Tim. And I guess right now I can just shoehorn in our synopsis about Jumanji. If, if you don't know Jumanji, you discover a board game. It's not a video game like in the updated versions. It's a board game that these kids discover in an attic somewhere and they play it. And wouldn't you know it, it's more than a game you play. It's an immersive experience where it's dangerous and you can be trapped in there for years, such as the case with Robin Williams's character, who's been in there for 26 years. He went missing as a child. His parents eventually just, I mean, we don't know where he is he's gone and then his parents pass away and then he's back and we're trying to rectify a lot of things but we also need bonnie hunt's character sarah to help us solve this mystery get robin free and get everybody out alive of this really really scary board game so with that setting the table let's get to movie talk for jumanji Darina, nothing gives me greater pride than to realize that uh, you and I are two of the more attractive folks that did see this film in a theater when we were kids. So when you first saw this, was this like a movie that you had like circled and you're like, I want to go see, that's the one I want to go see? Did you just walk into the theater because it was movie day? What was your relationship with Jumanji as you walked into that theater for the first time? Well, Mark, I had already developed a relationship with Lady Kirsten Dunst, uh, because she had just won an Oscar as a child for an interview yep. with a vampire. And obviously a huge fan of that movie because I'm the goth world girl. And I was very excited to see this because I'm also worship Robin Williams as a child. Right. So any Robin Williams movie that was out, I was going to go see it. And my family, my mom and my brother were, were definitely huge movie lovers like myself. We sat there with our uh, popcorn and the hot dogs and sandwiches and Mexican snacks that we brought into the theater, obviously. And we enjoyed the crap out of this. Like I, I was already hyped as a 13 year old girl. And this to to quote the wrong critic that uh, Tim read, this movie did not underachieve. It impressed us so much as a family because it looked amazing for the time. Like the, the effects were totally groundbreaking. It had a team of people like Ken Ralston from Death Becomes Her, uh, Tom Woodruff Jr., Aliens, like uh, Alec Gillis, who's uh, famous for animatronics from Tremors. Like I was like... It, this was a Darina movie. I, I was so excited. It had horror elements. Uh, it had a bunch of cool effects, uh, CG mixed with actual practical effects, which is my jam. And I tend to miss a lot in these movies. And of course, it had David Allen Greer, which was, you know, he's like the funniest guy. I love that guy. Love me some David Allen Greer. And I was a big fan of In Living Color. Um, Roxy, Jumanji. When did you first stumble upon Jumanji and, and what was your gateway into it? Was it the kids playing a game? Was it you loved Robin Williams? How did you get in there? I remember watching this on VHS for the first time. We had a, a room in the house that just had a very boxy TV in it and a mattress on the floor. And my <laughs> brother and I used to sit on the mattress and I remember we watched this movie and a movie that certainly did not hold up as well, The Indian in the Cupboard. Uh, we would watch those two movies back to back. One of those I stand by, the other I do not. And he showed this movie to me for the first time. I believe he saw it in theaters. And then when it came out on VHS, he convinced the fam to purchase it. And we loved this one. It was one of the only ones that both him and I agreed on. We were only two years apart, but when you're kids, that is a world of difference. And this was one of the only, I'm going to say there were five movies that we could both be like, all right, that's what we're doing tonight. We must have watched Jumanji like 20 times. Are you saying that it's not a finished room if it just has a TV and a mattress in there? If that's the case, I got some redecorating to do. <laughs> I don't know. I asked my parents about this a while ago. Why do we have a room with just a mattress on the ground? There was no sheet on the mattress. It was just a mattress on the ground. And they were like, it was very versatile. We did a lot of things with that room. So I, I don't know, just for you interior designers out there, something to think about. Uh, you can do a lot with a mattress <laughs> and a TV. You can do a whole lot. Uh, Steph, <laughs> you were introduced to Jumanji. Was it a family member twisting your arm like Roxy? How did you first come upon this game slash movie? I don't remember the moment of inception perfectly, but I do know similar to Roxy, there was two movies that me, my brother, and my sister would watch, and we loved so much. And it wasn't Robin Williams who we loved as, like that took longer in my life to realize what a legend he was. It was Jonathan Hyde, because in Richie Rich, he's Cadbury <laughs> and a legendary <laughs> character. And in Jumanji's obviously the dad and the Van Hyde, the crazy 
guy who comes out of the portal. But I, I, so those two movies were just like such great rides for me. And I was so, I love them both, but Jumanji was genuinely scary. And then upon rewatch, it was still scary. The way that the, at no point when I'm watching this film, do I think everyone's going to make it out alive? And I think that's a huge indicator of it being a horror film. <laughs> and the characters make dumb mistakes like horror, like a horror movie, but you're there for it. And you actually, there's moments of conversation, like the dialogue, is really good still. Sometimes when you rewatch 90s movies, you're like, ugh, it's a little awkward. But this one, I'm like, I love this movie just the same as I did when I was a kid and somehow I'm just as scared. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I found myself really gravitating towards the emotional aspect of this movie when I was rewatching it earlier this week. And so my favorite scene in the movie going into it, I was like, I remember the stampede scene when, when the rhino just like crushes a car, how awesome that looked on the big screen. But it was a very different moment upon rewatching it that got me as an adult. But the connective tissue is there between like an in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom from the 80s where kids were in in peril. And then you have like maybe Maybe Guillermo del Toro, who's a great horror filmmaker, who made something like Pan's Labyrinth, where, again, you, you fear for how are these children going to handle all of these events? And then sandwiched in between those two decades would be something like Jumanji. And so if we get into the movie itself, which is directed by Joe Johnson, and I point that out because he's done a lot of movies that people just loved from their childhood. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He did. Uh, he, he directed The Rocketeer, The Page Master. Mm -hmm. um, and he did Captain America, The First Avenger, you know? So... The, the, the guy clearly has a lot of game. Steph, what, what's the scene for you that you say, see, that's why I not only I love Jumanji, but why everybody should love Jumanji, but maybe it's a little too scary for the little tykes. I would say, okay, it's kind of a two-parter. It's when Robin Williams' character first goes into the portal, and then right when he comes out, the first person out of there is this man with a gun chasing him <laughs> and it's like how do you make it out of that and i just every time i'm like okay he's gonna be murdered right on site he makes it back to his house he's gonna die he doesn't die spoiler alert but i really <laughs> thought he was gonna die like this guy's coming at him then he goes to buy a gun because i guess that's easy to do in this great country instantly like in knows it's a yeah i don't know it's just scary this guy's chasing this guy these kids with a gun i was like whoa <laughs> yeah, Ro Rox, it really sets the tone because well, Jumanji, you would think that the movie would steer you towards wanting to play this game. At no point watching this movie did I ever want to touch a game like that. I looked at it like a Ouija board where I'm like, just get it out of my sight. Get it out of my house. I do not want to deal with this game. But what was it about the movie that locked you in? What was the scene that you and, and your brother on that mattress with no sheet just kept watching over and over again? There were two moments that really stood out for me. The one, the first one is so small that I, even upon rewatching it, I was waiting for it because I was like, please tell me I didn't make this moment up. This has to be a real moment. This, this is so much about my childhood. I'm putting a lot of weight on this. And it's when Robin Williams says to go get the ax. And, and as a monkey, he goes to get, the boy goes to get the ax and he goes, he grabs the ax to open up the thing and he's got the ax in his hand and he realizes it. It's like when somebody says, put on your sunglasses and you search for like an hour and they're on top of your head. I, <laughs> I, I love that moment as a kid so much. Like, it would I don't even remember me, that. Oh my, it's such yeah, a he, small he moment. He even looks at the, at the camera. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Like I just remember I used to laugh so hard because that is the kid humor in here that I I was just like, that's what happens. You went to the axes in your hand and you were trying to get the axe. It's the funniest thing. <laughs> but then as an adult for me, I think my favorite moment is when Robin Williams is stuck in the floor. It's just the coolest to look at. And I think that like all of us feel when you're watching that, that's where it is a little bit of a horror movie. I won't give Steph the, the satisfaction of saying that this is a horror movie, <laughs> but if there are horror movie elements, it's when like you can't use your hands, you can't move, you are stuck. And I don't want to see what that would look like if there was death by floor. I don't know. Is that like by a million splinters? I mean, how do you really, what really happens? That's, that's part two.
that's pretty terrifying to think about the the many different ways that you could die in Jumanji. And, and if you're in Jumanji, Darina, you want to go out like a champ. Like you want to be facing a rhinoceros head to head. You don't want to just be, hey, how do you die? How do you get up into heaven? Oh, I was stuck in a floor for all eternity. So couldn't quite pull it out. What's the <laughs> is it the floor scene for you? Is it uh, is it some of the relationships in the movie? What's the scene for for Darina now? Well, there's a couple. The 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 really uh, bizarre one that I still think is so bizarre, but I love it. Uh, and I don't think any of you notice this because you're not Mexican. But my Mexican family notices in the theater was when Van Pelt, who's the hunter, uh, who also plays the dad, goes into a gun store and buys a gun. And the entire scene, the Mexican national anthem is playing in the background. Oh. Even though they're in the U.S., it is so random. But obviously, everybody in the Mexican theater was like, "Yeah," you know, it was like, "It's <laughs> What can I do for you? What gross are these? You know, they stopped making these in 1903. I shall need a replacement weapon. Well, there's a waiting period, and you'll have to fill out these, or I could fill these out, Louise. So that was a fun one, but but uh, an actual like uh, I love all the action scenes. Like unlike Steph, I love anything that's gory, and I love uh, you know when people in the in the actual movie are scared. But there's a really sweet moment, uh, thanks to the great Robin Williams, uh, where he's kind of having a moment with uh, the little boy, and he's a monkey, and I think he has his tail stuck in his pants, and he's like helping him like get it out. <laughs> but uh, but at first he's very cold with him, and then he says, "I'm sorry." 26 years buried in the deepest, darkest jungle, and I still became my father, right? So that's a really cool uh, human moment that we had there, thanks to uh, the great Robin Williams, of uh, where you're in a crazy adventure movie that actually has this, like, big heart element to it. So I love that. I warned you about this, Peter. No, you wanted to play the game. What, are you crying? You don't cry, all right? You keep your chin up. Come on, keep your chin up. Crying never helped anybody do anything, okay? You have a problem, you face it like a man. Hey, hey. I'm sorry. 26 years buried in the deepest, darkest jungle and I still became my father. Yeah, and that was art imitating life a little bit because that poor kid, uh, Bradley Pierce, played played Peter, uh, and he was in the makeup chair for you know hours getting getting all that makeup on, and and he was interviewed about it, and he said that Robin Williams would come into the trailer and just sit next to him the entire time because Robin had just come off of filming Mrs. Doubtfire where he was going through a lot of extensive makeup. And so he was like teaching Bradley like meditation techniques, just like how to, you know, stay still and calm your mind and try to not get too restless. And it's like just a, a guy like that who could just be chilling in his trailer doing like I would be napping if I was the star of that movie when it, it's not my time to shine. I'm taking I don't care about kids. I'm taking a nap. He is in there supporting them. And ironically, Y'all know me. You, you, there's very few things that can get me like emotionally uh, to show him on the outside, but it's the end when we get to reunite. The, 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 the reuniting of a family, I was like, oh my God, why is this making me feel things? And I welled up a little bit. It's because we, we, ju we saw the thing and it was, him and his father particularly, they were just like ships passing in the night for like the last 26 years ever since they discovered the board game. And so just to see it have that sort of ending, I was like, it just, it, it made me feel so good. And the fact that we no longer have Robin in our lives as a current person, it just, it, it, it warmed my heart. It made me miss him, but I was just, I was feeling a lot of feels. And this is from the same guy who will ball watching Night of the Museum 3 at the end <laughs> because because Robin Williams plays yeah. Teddy Roosevelt and the movie was released after Robin had passed away. And there's a scene at the end where he's just, he's talking to Ben Stiller's, you know, manager character. And it's almost like he's saying goodbye to him, but he's also saying goodbye to us. And so Robin Williams has one of those, I don't know how he does it, but he's able to tug on my heartstrings like nobody else. Um, and, and I think part of that stuff is to your point where the tone of this film is scary and there is a lot of, horrifying elements, especially for kids in here. Do you think that that sort of helps the movie in a way, like stick with you long after you've, 
you stop watching it for the first time long after you've left the theater, you keep thinking about it because we felt like we were in real serious danger. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. More than a lot of movies that I watched when I was a kid, this one really stuck with me because it did. It scared me just enough where I still had fun watching it. But you know that scene where Alan Parrish is talking to the little kid. He just got out and he's like disheveled, unshaved, like wearing palm tree hat, uh, whatever that look was. And he's like, you've only you haven't even seen the things I've seen only in your nightmares. You think monkeys Mosquitoes and lions are bad. That's just the beginning. I've seen things you've only seen in your nightmares. Things you can't even imagine. Things you can't even see. There are things that haunt you in the night. Then something screams. Then you hear them eating. And you hope to God that you're not deserted. Afraid? You don't even know what afraid is. I was like, oh my God, it's getting real right now. Are we going to give this man some support? So (laughs) yes, yes, those are the moments where that's like Oscar worthy Robin Williams coming through in a children's movie, but just elevating it where if someone else said that line, like no shade to some of the new adventure type movies we've seen, um, the ones that resemble games or rides. I always know it's a ride or a game that's really, really made for children. But Jumanji feels like it hit the sweet spot of both like adult and kid fun and scary. Yeah, Darina, it's an essential part of of a lot of people's childhood. And I think that one of the reasons is because it's lasted with us so long because it had such a visceral impact the first time we saw it when maybe we weren't like, you know, adult, even you and I watching that in a theater. It's like, oh, my God, this is like this is scary, but it feels real. And I'm glad everything worked out okay. But there's a lot of scary crap like the 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 monkeys themselves, like getting sucked, the bats in that movie, the monsoon. There's a lot of scary (laughs) shit. Uh, I mean, scary, I guess, to a kid and to Steph, but uh, but for the 90s, for sure. I mean, it, it's it's similar to the feeling that we all got watching Jurassic Park for the first time in the theater. Right. Where you're you're stressed out, but you're having fun at the same time, kind of like living life and experiencing it. Uh, but um, I, I do have to say, like, it, there's so many um a stressful parts specifically, but also funny in those stressful moments. Like obviously the monkeys riding the motorcycle is one of my favorites because <laughs> it's so stupid, but also the stampede. I mean, there's that rhino at the end that's just like struggling to catch up to the stampede. And I think that's the most relatable rhino on screen. Wheezy, I believe. Um, and and Roxy, I was, I was reading some some research that the great Mark Hoffmeyer did for us about this movie. And apparently that was just because the visual effects team they couldn't get the rhino to move any faster and make it feel as realistic as it was. And so it was just a slow moving rhino, but it it sort of endeared the rhinoceros to me more. Like if it was just (laughs) the most, the most athletic rhinoceros ever, I don't think I would have responded to him, Roxy. No, super relatable. That rhino was the most relatable character in the whole film. I'm with you guys. Like you, we, We've all been that rhino before, and that's okay. It's okay to be the rhino. That's yep. the point of the film. I, I think that it actually is a scarier movie as an adult, though, because did you, your guys' mind starts to wander too, right? Like you are sitting there thinking, what were those 20-plus years? Like, wh- right. How, how are you still here? Are you okay? Like, I feel like therapist rocks kicks in and is like, tell me what that was like for you, Robin. What was that like for you? Yeah. Like, and, and the actual like mental fear of being stuck for that long. As a kid, I don't remember being afraid of this. I remember thinking it was so fun. I remember thinking those That's spiders, because they don't look like real spiders. They look like, they look like big creepy crawlers. I remember thinking that that would have been like, Oh, cool. You take the axe, you chop the spider like video gamey. But as an adult, it's a lot scarier. Not horror, but scarier. Also, to add to Roxy's point, what about Bonnie's Bonnie Hunt's character? She has to deal with the you know 26 years of nobody believing her that she saw this kid get sucked into a board game. Yeah. That she is insane. She doesn't believe herself. She, uh, when you hear her on the phone with her therapist, she's like, "Talk me off a ledge." He's <laughs> sitting right here. I see him, and you just like that. I, I have memories like that. I'm sure you guys do too. As a kid, where you're like, "Did I make my whole life up? Did this actually <laughs> happen?" And to, to think that you saw something that everybody around you tells you you're crazy—that's horror. 
Are we mad at her a little bit, though? That she didn't roll the die again? Yeah, she she just ran and never looked back. But as a child, Steph, you would have run, too. Admit it. It's giving Evan Hansen vibes. (laughs) Here's the thing. I feel like I would have run initially. I'm not going to say that, oh, yeah, I would have. I would have been the hero in that moment. But, you know, I might have ran. And then as I got a little older, I might have, like, gotten a gym membership. And I might have, like, hired a trainer and been like, hey, (laughs) like, a year from today, I'm rolling the dice. And I'm going back in there after my (laughs) friend. Like, I am getting in shape. You're getting in shape for for the draft? Cool. I'm going in shape to go to the, the jungle in a board game to rescue Robin Williams. Like, that's a pretty... It, it, that's a that's a you could also like hire special forces maybe to play the game with you because then they could come in so exactly. I, I think there's workarounds you might have experimented within that tw- that 26 years but i do give her props for she clearly made her decision like i'm never going back to i'm never going to revisit this and the kids were able to convince her hey sarah we kind of need you like right now <laughs> i mean kind of we totally tricked her into it we, she won't roll yeah. the dice and robin williams is like oh boom there there you did it that's you rolling it <laughs> who are we really mad at it can't be but robin williams even, like, but it's robin williams, robin williams. <laughs> yeah but the way she rolled the dice the first time as a child i know we shouldn't blame children for stupid mistakes but she was like I'm not playing games. I haven't played the games in 10 years. And she just drops the dice. I'm like, you just played the die. You just played the die, Sarah. And now you left your friend. It but we forgive her. It was full circle. It was full circle. They needed to grow together. Exactly, Steph. See, everybody did, ha, was at fault, but they, but every single character, there was growth throughout the movie. And that's important and not seen as much in family movies, I think. And then you, you look at the the special effects, the visual effects aspect of this movie, because Doreen, as you pointed out, there, there's some geniuses behind the scenes here. And some of it did build upon what we saw in Jurassic Park a couple of years earlier. And the director, Joe Johnston, I love bringing him up because he's made some of our childhood favorite movies. And he also worked on both of those Ewoks made for TV movies, the Caravan That's of right. Courage and Battle for Endor. Even before that, Joe Johnston is credited with the design of some little green Muppet named Yoda. He w- was sort of, you know, kind of had that iteration of Yoda as this little green thing that doesn't look like a Jedi, but he can still make your X-Wing come out of the swamp when you really need it. Um, Does I mean he did? Joe Johnston um, hero he is. I, I didn't know if she'd do it. I didn't want to prompt her, <laughs> but Roxy is famous so... for having a great Yoda impression. And Excellent. thank you for thank you for that, Rox. That, that means so a lot. Yeah. That wasn't it, it, for you. That was for Joe Johnston, okay? That was for Joe. That's for you, Joe. It's developed from sounding like Gollum meets Pee Wee, but now it's actually getting better, Roxy. I have to give you props. I think it's really spot on, and you guys are all gaslighting me (laughs) the way that we gaslit Sarah for 20-something years when she thought that she watched somebody disappear. That's what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, you have the force. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you sit this this can you sit kids down now in front of this movie in front of this Jumanji and do you think they'd respond to it do the effects hold up in that sense cuz for us we're always going to remember I think the first time we saw it and and it felt so believable to us do you think that we can do that with kids of today I think if the kids smart <laughs> they'll like it <laughs> I don't know. I have okay. I've unfortunately have to spend a lot of time with the youth because I'm the oldest cousin out of like a crop of forty little kids, and wow. they're no wonder you drink beer. I love the yeah. I love them, but they're very pretentious. You know, like they know a lot. They're smart, and so I think that if they just let the ride take them, they would really enjoy it because it does hold up in so many ways. But I could see them being like. That CGI doesn't even look real, like mid movie. And then they just they take themselves out of it. But I think there's a big group that would still love it. Yeah. And you have the the, the Jumanji, uh, the, the two more recent ones. You have Jumanji, um, you know, Welcome to the Jungle and the mm-hmm. Next Level. And I enjoyed both those movies. Fine. I really did. And I thought that they approached those two films the right way to not tread over, to not rhino stomp. <laughs> the previous Jumanji and and Dwayne Johnson is on record as saying like he didn't want it to be a remake he wanted to be a continuation because he wanted to honor the legacy of Robin Williams do we feel like that those two movies achieve that 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 they're actually nice companion pieces to the original I'll I'll start with you Darina I mean I I only saw the first one Um, I think it's it's a fun movie it just to me maybe because I'm more of Mark's age it doesn't hold up uh, to the same heart that the original Jumanji had and that could just be because we're missing 
Robin Williams, right? Like I love the original cast so much. I love Bunny Hunt. I miss her. Kirsten Dunst. Like I think it's it's just a a slightly different movie that was made for modern times. And um and I still also miss a lot of the practical effects and the animatronics. Yeah, they, they they made a great point in uh in in sort of making this movie that they wanted to take the practical effects as far as they could. So make the practical effects sort of the groundwork and then just put the VFX on top of it. And it seems like, you know, a lot of movies today for a myriad of different reasons that I'm sure are, are noble and they want to tell the story that they want to tell. But it seems like sometimes they do just rely on visual effects. But we're getting back to a world where you do see some more practical stuff than you used to. So that gives me some hope for the future of movies like this. Roxy, do you appreciate what the new Jumanji films are bringing, that they honor the legacy of the original? They certainly make money. They are both like within <laughs> shouting distance of a billion dollars worldwide. I think that they're excellent. I think the entire Jumanji franchise hits it out of the park because that's what, if you're going to do a, a reboot or a, a sequel, whatever we want to call it when it's that far after, if you're going to do that, then you need to be true to the the story. You need to be true to the to the heart of it, but you should also take your creative liberties. And I feel like tonally, they are very different. The characters, we got really fun new characters. Do I love them as much as I love the OG 85 Jumanji? No, of course not, because what year was it? Did I make up those? 85. 95. 95. Yeah, I was like, no, that's not right. I was, I was born when this came out. 95 Jumanji? <laughs> She's here, I swear. Do I love it as much as I love the 95 Jumanji? No, I would never because that would be sacrilegious. You know, that would be horrible to the inner child in me. But did I think that they were really fun watches, both the first and the second, which was actually very similar to the first, but I didn't care because it's fun enough that I would sit down and watch it again. They were they were all so lovely. Like they were funny. They were laugh out loud funny and they have charismatic actors in them as well. Nobody is Robin Williams. But if we're going to start to pick people who can really bring your attention to the screen, then, yeah, The Rock's a pretty good one. Uh, Kevin Hart's a pretty good. We've got some pretty good ones there. Yeah, Jack Black, Karen Gillan. It's a great cast and, and, and they're fun to watch. But, it, Steph, you pointed out earlier that it, even even when you first saw this Jumanji, the, the OG, it wasn't like you weren't aware of Robin Williams as like the person that you would come to know and love. I'm assuming we all love Robin Williams here. So I just want to ask you all, what was your entry point into not just knowing who he was, but holding him as a beloved figure in your world? Do you want do you want us to start crying? Is that what you want, Mark? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it'll work for me. So okay. I mean, look, look, when I, I I'm probably like you where um, I first saw him in Mork and Mindy. Right. Like uh, in, in reruns. Right. So I, I saw him uh, and I just thought he was funny. And I kept saying, Nanu, Nanu, Nanu. And, and I loved him. But the first movie that like actually made me cry as a kid was Mrs. Doubtfire because my parents got divorced when I was five. So I saw that as a young child and I, it was so impressionable for me, like at the end where she where he does the speech as Mrs. Doubtfire on the TV. And she tells, you know, it's it's not your fault. It's going to be OK. I was just like as a little Dorina, I was I, oh, it was a whole thing. So every that ever since then, I've loved that man. And, and I've seen every single one of his movies. I love that they didn't get back together at the end of Mrs. Doubtfire. Yes. I thought that was a really important thing because it just feels like it, Chris Columbus or, or the team knew a lot of kids mm -hmm. are going to be watching this movie. This is going to be a big hit. Let's not build up false hope for all of those kids from divorced parents. Let's not make them all think that all dad has to do is dress up like a woman and everything will be <laughs> fine and they're going to get back together. Um, I actually didn't come across his Mork and Mindy work first. My first intro to Robin Williams was Good Morning Vietnam. And I just thought it was mm -hmm. funny watching this guy in the military just yelling and saying whatever he wanted to on the radio. And then I went to a Monday night football game where we lost to the Cowboys. And I was in like fifth grade and it was so late by the time we got back, my mom let me sleep in from school the next day. That's how cool my parents were. And so I woke up at like noon and I'm thinking, oh, sweet. I got the whole day off. And she's like, no, you're, you're getting dressed and you're going to school. But first you can watch the rest of Mork and Mindy. And I'm like, what the hell's Mork and Mindy? And then she's like, you've never heard it's young Robin Williams. And I watched it and I was just like, this guy, there's nothing this guy can't do. Steph, your first time realizing the genius that was Sir Williams. I don't want to say it was Flubber, but it might have been Flubber. <laughs> we'll take Flubber. I, <laughs> I think that movie hit really hard for me. Uh, something about it. Maybe it's because the like same time as Nickelodeon slime. We just loved that. Our generation loved that. But I missed Outfire was another one that I feel like always was playing on TV and I never got sick of watching it. And I think the more I it was kind of like a slow burn for me. 
But then the more I fell in love with comedy and comedic actors, the more I started to realize how rare he was because a lot of comedians can't break out of just being funny and it's hard to take them serious. And I think Kevin Hart is starting to do it now. The Rock's not, or Dwayne Johnson's not a comedian, but he does like a lot of comedic movies. And to me, it's hard to look at them as serious actors too. And I think they need like separate entities to show showcase each. It's not usually in one movie, but Robin Williams in one movie could be serious and funny and the same character in a way that n- not really anyone else could do it. So it was just like the more and more I kept watching it, him and then realizing his voice was in Aladdin. I didn't know that until like yeah. 10 years after I watched Aladdin. It's just like, what can't <laughs> this guy do? Uh, Steph, you might have to stay parked there and we'll just do another episode right after this because unfortunately, Flubber, 24% on the No, minutes, come on. Yeah. And the Flubber audience score is only 33%. So that, uh, uh, Producy Lucy, make a note. We're probably Do talking about Flubber at some point no in the future. Soul. Um, <laughs> no soul. Roxy, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Aladdin was your intro, was your gateway to Robin. I, I think probably, but obviously being from Boston, I have, I, there's one. There's one that is like my most memorable. And of course okay. it's Goodwill Hunting. Uh, <laughs> You know, when when Darina said it's not your fault, speaking about Mrs. Doubtfire, of course that uh, it almost brings you to tears thinking about it's not your fault on repeat to Will. Um, and this was the first. This is true. This I think I must have been. The movie came out in ninety seven. I was probably three years after that. I was about ten years old. I had an audition. And I, what I auditioned with was his entire, you don't know about real loss because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. And I doubt you have ever dared to love anybody that much speech. Yeah. I, I was 10. <laughs> I was 10. And that was the, that was the monologue I decided to perform because he meant everything <laughs> to me. Like this was. Is there I, tape of this? Is there uh, video evidence of this? I got to find something. I mean, I, I, at one point I knew every single word to the entire movie but Robin Williams' character in that movie is the, he is the like soft place to land. He is the, even though he's got a little edge to him, he is the voice of reason. He is the person that you need in your life to explain things to you and to to make you more of a human and, and less of a cold-hearted brat. And I needed Robin Williams in so many different areas of my life and he always delivered. I love this man so much uh, forever and always. So let's take this uh, let's take this opportunity to talk a little bit about Bitch Out of Water, but I want to keep it in the world of Jumanji. So y'all's <laughs> new podcast endeavor is is you relating life experiences that you've had, and it can be some heavy stuff. It can be lifestyle choices. It can be travels. It could be really anything that you have experienced and left a mark on you. How would the world girls handle having either Alan, Robin Williams' character, or Sarah, Bonnie Hunt's character, and all of the, I imagine, PTSD that they have from this board game experience? It feels like Bitch Out of Water would be the perfect podcast for them to really talk about what happened. I mean, look, <laughs> Bitch Out of Water is really, uh, the whole point of the world girls is that we give things a whirl, right? And so we give fun things a whirl, like going to Disneyland and, and creating uh, bottle rockets and celebrating holidays like Day of the Dead. But in this podcast, we talk about human experiences, right? And, um, and, and all kinds of things like Steph being mixed and me being polyamorous and uh, Roxy talking about grief and uh, her mom dying. And so this is really where we talk about our trauma and our, you know, PTSD. From all from from all of life's uh, amazing, joyful, as well as bitter experiences, all of the joy and the pain and the suffering. So I think that I would love it if somehow in some other dimension we could interview uh, the entire cast of Jumanji. And make right. them feel a little bit better about the things they've going through. Exactly. And also kind of like Jumanji, how maybe Steph looks at it like a horror movie. But sometimes for me, it's more of a comedy. This is my, the classic line that Steph says. Anytime we're thinking about the new podcast episodes we're going to do, she's like, but we're going to make it funny, right? Because we don't like we don't like to just talk about the trauma without the laughter. So. I feel like Jumanji it would be a very similar yeah. tone. Yeah. We'd be like, remember you almost died? Ha <laughs> ha! Like it'd be such a fun conversation with them. <laughs> but that's why you are the perfect three 
folks that I know that I've ever met to do an endeavor like this is because you have heavy life experiences, but you're always able to inject humor into it. And that's how we cope with this stuff. That's how that's how I imagine, uh, you know, Alan's parents um, or it, it really any. That's how these kids when when they're dealing with stuff, because their kid, these kids lost their parents. And, you know, at least at the beginning of the movie, we get to rectify some stuff towards the course of the end. But it's like there's a lot of stuff going on here. And so it's just it's one of those things. It's an outlet that we all need. And maybe that's why this version of Jumanji speaks to all of us in our childhood and in our adulthood is that there's something in there for everyone and it feels real and it feels emotional and it grabs you and it doesn't let go. But the world girls do the world girls and y'all can answer this individually if you want to or as a collective. I don't care. Do the world girls. You're you're at home and you, you're digging around your attic and you find the board game Jumanji. Do you open it? Do you roll the dice? 100 percent. Yes. But these two, I can't even get them to do a Ouija board with me right now. No. They, they're like true believers in whatever's out there. But I'm making them play. No. I, I have forced them to play Jumanji. This is something that I'm going to make happen and plant spiders all over the place and get a lion. I will tape my fists. I'll tape my hands and I'll tape 40s to them. I'll be like Edward Scissorhands with the 40s and not participate. You can't get me to roll a die. I'm not messing with the spirits. I like the spirits. I come in peace. I'm not going to wake you up. Not rolling die, Roxy. That's all you. (laughs) Look, but the, the here's the thing, though. We're talking about, you know, both joy and loss in Jumanji. And we haven't talked about the great James Horner, by the way, who's also passed away and composed the mm-hmm. amazing score to this movie. But if somehow we got to reunite with like James Horner and Robin Williams and all these people, Steph, would you play Jumanji? If there was a guarantee, I wouldn't die or be um, like mutilated by some animal. There's no guarantee ever in life, Steph. Here's what I'm thinking. We <laughs> hold her down. We tickle torture her. We put the dye in her mouth and then we poke her stomach so she has to spit it out and roll. I've that already figured roll. it out. That yeah, counts that as counts a roll, as a Steph. Roll. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think everyone listening, you just heard Roxy's origin villain story because that was <laughs> evil. <laughs> Do it for the world girls. Do you understand I, or not? That's the assignment. I, I, I was in I was in on ticklish a little bit, but it's like, I, I don't know. She also, you got to remember, she has two 40s tuck tape to her hands. And I'm a big fan of beer grip stuff. So I, I don't <laughs> want to mess with that. We can let her sit this one out. As, as I said about Ouija boards in my special, I don't believe in it but I don't not believe in it. Get it away from my house. Uh, <laughs> closing up shop here. I, I did get a chance. The first, I've, I, I've actually gotten to hang out with Robin Williams a few times. And every time it was just like, you wake up the next day and you're like, did that really happen? First time I ever met him, Saturday night before the Oscars at the Comedy Store. He came in to pop in on stage and uh, in the original room. And I was an employee and he comes in. I'm the first one that he sees as he comes through that front curtain. Y'all have been through that way in the original room before. And he comes in and I'm just like, oh, hey, Robin, I'm Mark. Um, I, I just started working here. And uh, and he said, oh, oh. Um, and he said, I think he said something like, and which department are you? And I said, I, I just answer phones right now. And so he pantomimed without missing a beat, holds a phone up to his ear. And he said, oh, I still have no idea what the f- I'm doing yet. And uh, <laughs> and then he gave me a big hug. And then he went on stage to a standing ovation and uh, killed for 20 minutes, got off stage, another standing ovation. And we got to uh, chew it up in the back for a little bit. And it's one what? of the. Uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the great memories of, uh, of a great man that uh, I will always cherish. So that is going to do it for us here today on just that episode where I knew my job was going to be easy, but y'all made it even more simple for me to just set you up. And we just are off in a world of pure imagination. Thanks to the world girls who I love dearly. Uh, let's talk a little bit more and let all the kids know where they can find the world girls empire in general. And then this new podcast offshoot, Bitch Out of Water have at it. I'm going to let Rossi do it because she's the longest running host here. Oh, great. The World Girls. We we have a website, so we keep it nice and easy for you guys. Theworldgirls.com. If you want to find our podcast, theworldgirls.com slash podcast. It's everywhere that podcasts are. Apple, Spotify, and it's called Bitch Out of Water. I don't know if we made your job super simple, Mark, because we made you say bitch like 15 times this episode. But if you've ever felt like a fish out of water, Bitch Out of Water is for you. Plus, we are live every Wednesday and Sunday nights on youtube.com slash theworldgirls. We give things a whirl. So like Darina said, anything from Disneyland to Day of the Dead, uh, to Mukbang, if you don't know what that is. 
Go check out an episode in which we try to eat 100 pieces of sushi and get really, really sick. Never have I shaken back and forth like that in my life. And uh, you can also follow us on social media at The World Girls and World Girls WAP if you're on Instagram. 100 pieces of sushi. Steph, you must have led the way on that one, right? Yes, definitely, Mark. Thank you for thinking that. Do do not lie. Do not lie right now. I held down the fort. Um, However way you want to interpret that, that's what I did. I provided a lot of support. (laughs) Mark, she she hid all of the avocado sushi by herself and ate that while Darina and I had to eat all of the fish sushi. It's on tape. There's evidence. She's an avocado girl. As the only Japanese person in this group, I feel like it's my right to do with the sushi what I wanted to do. But I would never throw you under the bus. It was just the avocado rolls were by me. Mm-hmm. I mean, if mm-hmm. I had to, I'm not the world's biggest sushi eater. I, I will I will get it down if, if the challenge is brought. And I would probably lean towards the avocado sushi because avocado, hey kids, that's the good kind of fat. So Roxy Stryer, Doreen Ariano, and Steph Sabra. Beer drinking now, Steph Sabra. Thank you all so much for, uh, for, for gracing us with your presence and chatting Jumanji. Best of luck. I know the podcast is going to be a huge hit, as is everything the world girls do. And please come back soon individually as a team. We just love having you here at Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. Gracias. We love you, Mark, and Rotten Tomatoes, and Lucy Producey. <laughs> and Brian. <laughs> Brian! Boy, Brian. And the man. Lucy <laughs> and the entire team here at Rotten Tomatoes. Brian borrowing his friend uh, Draco, uh, who's a little dog from Christian Rubalcaba today. So Aww. everybody was in the house for this episode of Jumanji. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time here at Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong.